Tonight we have the pleasure of hosting Dawn and Marion from Both Lives Matter. Both Lives Matter are a movement of individuals and organisations seeking to reframe the abortion debate in Northern Ireland and beyond, to advocate for better care in pregnancy crisis and to create a culture that values every woman and her unborn child. They speak life and hope into the difficult and divisive debate on abortion and offer an alternative voice that calls for better choices. Dawn and Marion, you're both very welcome and we look forward to hearing from you later in the service. Before we spend some time in praise, just a couple of announcements to make. Our service next week, the 5th of March, morning service will be at 10.30am where we'll be hearing from Drew Gibson and then meeting back at 6.30 in the evening where we'll be hearing from David Keyes. And then a final reminder that the EBM collection for Turkey, um, the earthquake in Turkey, the last donations will be collected this Tuesday, the 28th. Um, so if you could bring them in before then, that would be great. So I'm now going to hand over to Catherine and the band. There we are. Good evening. Um, we're just going to begin our evening of praise, just focusing our eyes on our God who is loving and gracious and merciful to us each day. So if you'd like to stand, we're going to worship together.
pray before we sing our final song, before we have our speakers come and speak to us. Let me pray. Father God, we just thank you for this evening and we just thank you for the opportunity to get, we get to worship and, and meet together. And God, we just thank you for the truth of these songs that, God, that you paid a debt that we can never afford. So God, as we just lift our voices one final time before we open a topic that we know um, is a very much talked about topic, God, we, we just pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to what you have to um, have us learn this evening. So we just pray all of these things through the precious and holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Donna Marion to join me on stage and um, before I ask you to um, you begin speaking I'd like to introduce yourselves and each tell us a little bit about your role in the organization. Good evening my name is Dawn McAvoy and um, I work for the Evangelical Alliance and they um, with them I co-founded the campaign Both Lives Matter in 2017 so that's pretty much my my day job. Um, hi, um, I'm Marion and um, I volunteer with Both Lives Matter. Um, so that consists of uh, me um, tagging on with Dawn while we do talks and create resources and um, speak into this issue. 
Thank you both. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask Dan and, Dawn and Marion a question um, towards the end of the service, and a number and email address will come up, and I'll remind you of that. Um, but for now, let me pray. Lord, we thank you for Dawn and Marion and for the work of Both Lives Matter. In an era where it is often difficult to swim against the tide of public opinion, we thank you for faithful and courageous people willing to stand in the public sphere as your representatives. Lord, would you bless Dawn and Marion as they speak and help us to listen and respond thoughtfully to their message. In your name, amen. I left my um, clicker down here, so excuse me. It really is a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Um, we were here a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, and um, it's, it's wonderful to be back, although as we were reminded when we were meeting to prayer, so much has changed from the first time that we were here. So for those of you who don't know us, um, the uh, vision of our campaign is to imagine a people and place that values the life and health of women and unborn children and pursues the well-being of both. Now, the law may have changed for us very sadly, but our vision remains. It was never just about having a law that says no to abortion. Now, before we begin, I do want to say right up front, um, we have rarely done a talk where someone in the room hasn't been impacted personally um, or someone connected to them by abortion. But it's not just abortion when we talk about pre-born life. It brings up the issues of miscarriage, um, maybe stillbirth, fertility issues and, and potentially infertility as well. We're sensitive to all of that, and I do want to um, assure you that nothing we are saying tonight is designed to offend. We certainly would hope that it wouldn't be found to be hurtful, um, either in our language or in what is on the screen. So we would ask you to be um, gracious to us, to understand our heart, but if we do hurt anybody or say anything that anybody finds offensive, we would please ask you not to leave tonight without speaking to us or to somebody. Certainly do not carry a burden away with you. That would be the last thing that we would want to happen. Both lives matter. You wouldn't imagine that that would be a radical statement, but it is in 2023. A pro-choice culture says that the choice of termination is needed because both lives can't either equally matter or indeed don't always matter. A pro-choice abortion culture says one of those lives actually never matters, the pre-born life and that the choice to terminate that life is both a normal and amoral decision that should be available freely. Some would even say that it's a human right to end a human life. So we've ended up in this culture war, in a culture battle, and on the front line are women who face a real crisis too often, women facing an unplanned or unwanted or crisis pregnancy feel that they have no other alternative than to terminate their unborn baby. And in the culture war, women, all women, are actually told that they are at war with their own bodies. Our bodies are the problem, and our children pre-birth and post-birth are a problem to be got rid of. In a crisis pregnancy, it can be made to appear that it is women, a woman versus her unborn child, like in a tug of war, and one, as with tug of war, one must lose. Behind the front line of women in crisis is an ideological battlefield that says that without abortion as a human right, society is saying women will lose, that women rely on abortion to live their lives and thrive. Our starting point counters that vision of that tug of war. 
It's profoundly simple that there are two lives in existence in every pregnancy, and we say that both of those lives matter. We are pro-woman and we are pro-life, we're pro-both, and we refuse to play that game of tug of war. The ground rules that have developed over the past 50 odd years must change to ensure that both can win, both can live and thrive together. We would say, propose, that true justice, genuine compassion, real progress and human dignity for all demands that we don't play that tug of war. And for people who claim to follow Christ, there's an additional um, issue to take into consideration. God's word. The sensitive, contentious, battleground issues of pregnancy crisis and abortion can't and shouldn't be dictated to by political and cultural trends where we lay the word of God aside. So tonight we want more than to just to give you information to share our heart for both lives that we genuinely believe is God's heart in a way that touches and inspires your heart. So we'll look at some of the laws surrounding abortion, how those laws affect the rates of abortion and at who is aborted. So we'll look at fetal development. We won't show images of aborted fetuses and we want to assure you of that up front. The church and abortion. We must rely on God's word to guide and confront us as we think about both lives. And as we speak, our prayer is that you will be thinking about your place in all of this. We believe there's a better story for our women and girls, for families and society than abortion. And we invite you to take that before God as we have and continue to do in an act of intentional submissive service. We believe that God's way, that God's word is the way to respond to a pro-abortion and increasingly pro-abortion ideology and culture. And it is the truth that we stand on that brings life and counters the death of abortion. Because both lives matter, we are a movement of individuals and organisations seeking to reframe the abortion debate in Northern Ireland and beyond, to advocate for better care in pregnancy crisis, and to create a culture that values every woman and her unborn child. We believe in a trinity of laws that protect every life, services that enable every life to be chosen, and a culture that affirms every life regardless of health, ability, gender, age, stage, or location. We want to speak and stand for and with both lives, because both lives matter. But in the context of a pro-abortion, pro-choice culture, what are the alternatives for women? After over 50 years of UK government laws and policies that have supported and sponsored abortion provision, many people, many individuals, including our legislators, simply cannot see any other solution to a pregnancy crisis than abortion. In 2018, Anna Subri, MP, posed this question in the House of Commons in Westminster when the law here, the previous law, was right at the heart of uh, the culture battle that was going on in Westminster. Anna Subri asked or shouted at Sammy Wilson across the House of Commons, what are you going to do? Make them stay in Northern Ireland to have children that they don't want? What's your solution? Now at that stage in 2018, abortion had been legal for over 50 years. Many pro-choice advocates would say legalising abortion doesn't increase the rates of abortion, it just makes abortion safe. Last year, 2021, saw the highest rates of abortion ever recorded since 1967, with, over, with about 215,000 terminations. 50 plus years of Anna Subri's 
comment there that implies women need abortion hasn't helped women who face pregnancy crisis. Abortion rates just continue to rise. Whatever part of these islands we live on, we must have a better solution than one that presumes women need an unlimited choice of the termination of life. Because women, unborn babies, men and families deserve better than the decades old failed legal and social model of abortion. Now we don't have time tonight to go into international law and national law. I will just say two things. There is no human right to end a human life, even though that is the agenda of some activists. And prior to the law change, the law in Northern Ireland had been deemed compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, broadly compatible. But pro-abortion activism then and now, even with our law change, remains relentless. And the trajectory of what is called progress and the agenda of many who call themselves progressive is that there will indeed be a human right to end a human life. And the French president, Emmanuel Macron, in January 2022, just a year ago, he stated that his objective was for abortion to be added to the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The law continues to be a battleground. The law has changed in Northern Ireland. The previous law held both lives in tension and protected both as far as was humanly possible, striking a very difficult and delicate balance. It reflected the biological and relational reality that both lives and pregnancy are intimately linked. That law meant that over 100,000 people in the 50 years between 1967 and 2017 when we launched our campaign, over 100,000 people here were living who would not have been if the law here on abortion had been as it was in England and Wales. Laws matter. When abortion law changed in 2019 here, and we still haven't seen the full outworking, we know that the impact on culture and on society, we knew then and we know now that it will be significant. The law now in Northern Ireland permits abortion up to 12 weeks without question for any reason. Up to 24 weeks of pregnancy if the woman um, is deemed to be at risk uh, in an undefined and undiagnosed mental health well-being is at risk. There's abortion up to birth in Northern Ireland if the unborn child has been diagnosed with what would be termed as a fatal fetal abnormality. And there's abortion up to birth in Northern Ireland if the child is diagnosed with what would be termed a severe anomaly or disability. And there is no criminal offence for a woman to self-induce her own abortion up until birth. That's where the law has now taken us. So we've gone from a place where we had the most protective law in Europe to having the least protective law in Europe. Now we all understand that what it says on paper can be very different to what it looks like on the ground with service provision. And that remains contested. But the law does matter. Since 2019, there have been medical terminations and surgical terminations happening in Northern Ireland. A Freedom of Information request found that between the end of March 2020 and the end of September 2022, there were over 4,000 terminations of pregnancy here, and that's without any centralised commissioning yet. There is a commitment from the UK Government and the Northern Ireland Secretary of State to uh, provide and promote abortion in Northern Ireland in line with the law that they introduced. Now before the law was changed, abortion rates here were six times lower than they were in England and Wales, with just under a thousand babies per year being terminated to women from Northern Ireland, either here 
or travelling across to England and Wales. But now, it has been suggested by another organisation that works in this space from papers that they have seen that there may indeed be, uh, or there's a plan to provide for up to 6,500 terminations a year. Now, you may wonder where that comes from, but it's just an extrapolation. One in four women um, in the UK will have an abortion by the time, sorry, one in three women by the time they're 45. For every four live births, there's one abortion. So they're applying those figures to Northern Ireland and predicting that they need to provide for as many as over 6,000 abortions every year in Northern Ireland. What will our pro-both response be, given the context of abortion being legal? Well, ultimately, we would like to see laws and policies that protect every human life, We'd like to see protection for women from the agenda of the demedicalisation of abortion that would remove health protections and includes ever easier access to chemical abortions. And we have always recognised the need to provide better supports and care services that would enable each human being to live and thrive, that would enable women facing an unplanned, unwanted or crisis in pregnancy to choose life for her and her baby. But those supports seem less and less likely. They're certainly more expensive than the implementation of a regime of abortion. An abortion agenda that is global, coordinated and strategic. In Western countries, the laws vary, but what the abortion rates look like are broadly similar. Numbers matter. 98% of abortions in England and Wales, and we would surmise the same here, um, are physically healthy women aborting healthy babies, performed for undiagnosed and undi undefined mental health reasons. But of course here, we know we don't even need a reason in the first trimester. Increasingly, abortions are chemical. 87% of abortions now are chemical, and by that I mean medication is taken, there's no surgery. 82% of abortions last year were for women whose marital status was given a single. Now that is not a statement of judgment, it's simply a statement of fact, and it reveals what we'll go on to talk about, which is that for most women, if they have the appropriate emotional, practical material support, they would rather choose life for their baby than not. 43% of abortions last year were for women who had at least one previous abortion. Abortion is increasingly being normalised and presented as a method of family planning. When it comes to disability, we know that between 75 and up to 90% of parents who receive a diagnosis of Down syndrome pre-birth will terminate their baby in GB. Overall, there's one abortion every three minutes. One in three women by the age of 45, and one in five babies. Numbers matter. So there's lots of talk, and there has been for um, several years now in Northern Ireland, Lots of media noise as well about abortion, about women travelling, about the law, about our culture. And it can be a confusing and overwhelming space to be in. It can also be um, a difficult space to navigate for young people. Um, I'm the mother of four girls. My eldest is currently in third year. Um, we're at that stage now where she's about to pick her GCSEs, so it's very scary for me. But she is coming home more and more regularly now with questions about how do I answer this question. She's very aware of the work that we do in Both Lives Matter. But the teenage um, conversation is increasing around this. Media impacts on that and also celebrity culture impacts on what our young people are hearing and seeing. And we know that young people can look up to these people that they see on TV, and um, they can idolize them sometimes, want to be them, and they put a lot of um, 
emphasis on the things that they hear their favorite pop star saying or their favorite movie star saying. So I think it's important as parents, um, as older siblings, as family members that we're aware as well of what celebrity culture and the media are saying in this space. But just to start off and bring back, um, I'm going to um, look at the stages of human life. Now, there's a vast array of people in um, of all of these stages right now. <laughs> there's probably a few missing, actually, in the congregation tonight, although um, it depends, I guess, if there's somebody sitting pregnant at the minute. Then we do have members who are in the stages of possibly embryo, fetus, I'm not sure. I don't think we have any babies here tonight, but I think we can all agree that we start off, all of us have started off from the same place, a fertilized egg. We're always human. It's a medical and scientific fact. Life begins at fertilization, conception. When human sperm meets human ovum, a new human being is created. Every cell in the human but one has 46 chromosomes. The sperm cell has 23, the ovum has 23. So it's the joining together of the both that is necessary for the creation of a new human. And so that's why this new human can never be simply part of the woman's body because this new human is made up with 23 chromosomes from the sperm cell. So we often hear this, that it's just part of the woman's body. Scientifically, it's not. Um, now the next images, as Dawn said, we don't show any images of aborted babies. So the images that I'm about to put up here, we've actually paid several thousand pounds from a medical um, uh, website that gathers them. So uh, these are verified um, and they're just showing the stages of development. So I hope everybody's okay. But as Dawn said at the start, please let us know um, if anything that you see has upset you or um, uh, caused you um, any difficulty. So like I said, we all begin life of fertilization. Someone comes into existence, someone who has never existed before and will never be created again. At fertilization, we all have a unique genetic code. It's at this stage that our skills and strengths are decided. At this stage, our gender, eye color, hair color, all decided. There's a separate blood flow between the woman and the baby created. And during the first trimester, the baby is referred to as an embryo in medical terms. And this is Greek for growing human. From four to six weeks, the heart begins to beat. Normally about three weeks after conception, the British Heart Foundation um, actually released a statement a couple of years ago saying that it was at three weeks. Five to six weeks then, the hands and feet begin to appear, the face is taking shape, and the brain starts to send signals down the developing spinal cord. At seven to eight weeks, the internal organs are in place. The skeleton is soft cartilage, and the body is essentially complete. And by 10 to 11 weeks, we have our own unique fingerprints, nails, feet, toes, all visible. The baby can make a fist, and the part of the brain responsible for memory is starting to form. And at 12 weeks, the face you can see there is clearly formed. The baby responds to touch, is active, does somersaults, kicks. And 12 weeks marks the end of the first trimester. So if you consider what Dawn just recently told, or told you a few minutes ago about the law now in Northern Ireland, and you look at that image and just put those two things together for yourself. At 12 weeks, the baby's called a fetus, and in medical terms, that's Latin for young one. Um, and we like to rehumanize this language again, so we're not too worried about using fetus and embryo. Some people like to use it to, to um, dehumanize, but we claim them back because we look at what they actually mean. At 19 weeks, the, babe, the mother sorry, can feel the baby kicking. Um, now, sometimes that can be earlier in subsequent pregnancies because you know what you're expecting to feel, so you might actually feel it earlier than 19 weeks, but usually in a first pregnancy, it's 19 weeks. And at 20 weeks, all the body systems are functioning. The baby drinks the amniotic fluid, passes it out as urine, and makes breathing movements and hiccups. And the rest of the pregnancy allows the baby's organs to strengthen for life beyond the womb. But you can see, I mean, the pregnancy is generally about 40 weeks. We're only halfway through here, and the baby is essentially complete in terms of all the body systems functioning and its growth from that point on and strengthening. 
So I said, obviously, that we can hear the media speaking into this issue. We have science speaking into this issue, law, celebrity culture, and Dawn mentioned God's word. What does God's word say? Well, the Bible is filled with a theology of life. Right from the beginning, when God creates, he gives life. And throughout God's word, we see God's design for his creation and the pinnacle of his design, human beings, made for relationship with him and stewards of God's creation. And we also see God's gut-wrenching and sacrificial love for his image bearers, the unborn, women, and families. Now, there has been a rise, and this would concern us quite a bit, um, a rise within the church of people using God's word to promote choice in terms of abortion. Um, within the last year or two, this movement started, uh, was created, Faith Voices for Reproductive Justice, and we would be very concerned at the narrative that they are speaking. Um, they recently called abortion peace, healing, freedom, and sacred. And we just simply cannot agree with this at all. It's a very extreme and a very minority view. Most people in our experience say something like, I wouldn't have an abortion, but it's not my place to say to someone else not to. And compassion can be seen as a choice for someone else. So this is quite radical and it is a minority view. But I, like I said, because, especially with our young people, they have access to social media, they see tweets, they see things on Facebook, and so it would concern us that they are seeing statements like this from people who are professing a faith. Some, most people will say things like, I'm pro-life, but they're ideologically pro-life and situationally pro-choice. So at the start we said that for people who claim to follow Christ, this is a sensitive, contentious battleground. Issues of pregnancy crisis and abortion can't and shouldn't be dictated by political and cultural trends. There was, before the law changed, a TV project called Abortion in Northern Ireland, Christian and Pro-Choice. And in it, one young woman said, being told by people who have encouraged me to become Christian that my opinion is wrong or that the Bible says something that contradicts my opinion is quite hard to hear. So that's the situation that we're sitting in, where people have a faith, but maybe they're being influenced by things that they're hearing. They're being influenced by friends. Um, I don't know if this young woman was grappling with the issue, confused about it, maybe making an opinion or had firmly cemented her opinion. She was asked for this interview. But she obviously was struggling with what the Bible says and her own personal belief around abortion, and it was conflicting for her. And that is a challenge for our young people in today's world. But whenever we think about God and we think about ourselves as Christians, our freedom in Christ requires us or requires our submission, sorry, to his authority. Now, submission can be a difficult word for people today. Um, and I know that it's something that we, we talk about um, a lot. But when God wants what is best for you, it's easy to submit to somebody who wants the best for you. So it says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people and live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Jesus saves the world from a false freedom, from freedom as a euphemism for power, from freedom as justification for killing. So whenever people say that they believe in choice, it's the choice to do what and for what and who is impacted. God is a God who sees and cares. The Bible shows us that very clearly. There's a young woman called Hagar, and we read about her in Genesis. 
Now Hagar was abused, exploited, misused by those responsible for her. And twice she ran away and twice God met with her. And at one point, Hagar names the Lord who spoke to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. God saw Hagar. God knew Hagar and she recognized that. He cared for her and her son, born and unborn. He provided for them and secured a just outcome for them. In submitting to God's word, the word is living in the person of Jesus. We're submitting to someone who knows us, who sees us, who cares for us. How should we respond to a woman facing an unplanned, unwanted or pregnancy crisis? Well, we would propose in the same way that God does. In the same way that God saw Hagar and sees everyone who is hurting and vulnerable and alone. We should respond with the love that he offers. He is love. His character should direct ours where the world is redefining what love is, we look to scripture to get a clearer picture. We know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And without God's way of responding, the truth can be lost in condemnation of a woman or affirmation of sin. Without the truth, we lose the way of responding we lose God's love. And without the truth and God's way, lives are lost, literally through termination or emotionally and spiritually through the harm that is done from the crisis and the response to it. God is compassion. And as God draws alongside us, we too must draw alongside those who suffer. God is justice and truth. And James 1.27 talks about true religion being the sort of religion that draws alongside those who are most vulnerable and marginalized. But there's a second part to that verse. True religion guards itself and those who are truly um, following Jesus guard themselves from Satan's or the world's lies. God is the God of women. As we think of God being the God of women, we look to scripture for the basis of that understanding. And we need to call out the misperception or misrepresentation that the only women that God is for are mothers and homemakers. And it's important to say that at this point because I know we're talking about pregnancy and pregnancy crisis, but not every woman will be a mother. And that's not the only um, destination that God is calling women to. So when we're talking to younger women particularly, we love to show them examples of women from scripture. Um, women who were in authority, women who ruled and led, women who worked in the public square and contributed to the public economy and actually then facilitated ministry and service in God's name. So when we say God is the God of women, we're not just talking about mothers and wives. God, however, is the God of both lives. And when we think tonight of women who are pregnant and in difficult circumstances and who are struggling with or wondering what they should and can do, we want to think about God being the God of both. Women and children are particularly vulnerable to exploitation and harm. And there are natural, st structural, physical, legal and societal differences between men and women and children that expose and also help create those vulnerabilities. 
And we acknowledge that people and systems, sometimes in God's name, have been a part of those harmful, exploitative and damaging behaviours. We've plenty of stories on our website where young women from good church-going families were taken to England for abortion because the private sin of an abortion was better than the public shame um, of an unplanned pregnancy. Burden and harm, shame and stigma is real, but that's not from God. God is never anti-women, although societies and even his church can be. Jesus refused to treat women as inferior or view women as unclean or especially deserving of punishment. He called them daughters of Abraham for the first time in scripture, giving them equal spiritual status with men. So yes, Jesus did confront sin, but he didn't condemn the people caught in sin at the same time as not condoning their sin either. He brought dignity and offered mercy, where a pious religion demands judgment. Jesus stepped over cultural barriers. He taught women, he included them in his group of disciples, and he installed them in his church as leaders. God is the God of women, and he's the God of both. From the beginning to the end, women were and are chosen by God to be part of his salvation story. In this picture, we see Mary, who said yes to God the Father, to be the mother of God the Son. But we also, in this picture, have an impression of God the Son, preborn. This picture portrays God as an embryo or as a fetus, preborn. God is the God of life from the beginning. He is the God of the unborn. He created all life, created us in his image. Before birth, we were created and known. And God alone has authority over life and death, creating us with purpose for a purpose. This doesn't kick in once we're born. We're made in his image with purpose for a purpose long before it. But we come back to real life situations of crisis. And again, we think of how do we respond as people who claim Jesus and claim love for God. We are to love God and love our neighbour. And that includes, and particularly perhaps includes, the woman facing pregnancy crisis. She is our neighbour and her unborn child is our neighbour. The greatest challenge is to put away the old self, which is pride and selfishness, to respond with God's heart in a way that serves others. And that can be a challenge. So we know that God loves both. We know that abortion is promoted in society today as an unrestricted choice. We know that we're meant to respond with God's heart. So why are women choosing abortion? So most often it is the circumstances that a woman is in that is the crisis. Um, And very often, if you see from here, these two sections, this is generally the 98% of abortions take place for these reasons. And then we have the 2%. Um, Now, we haven't divided those off to say that any are more of an influence on the debate than others. But what I would say is that it's that 2% that the last 10 years, really, um, of this discussion in Northern Ireland focused on. Um, and sometimes when you listened to the media you would have thought that every single woman who had been travelling from Northern Ireland to England um, for an abortion was travelling for one of those reasons of the 2% and that actually was not the case Dawn showed you some of the stats earlier on 
And so we have to go back to Stella Creasy's question. It was a really important question. I may fundamentally disagree with her position on abortion, but when I actually heard her ask that question, I thought, yeah, that question does need answered. It's not good enough. It wasn't good enough at the time she asked that to simply say, well, the law says no, you can't have an abortion. That was never good enough. This is about more than saying no to abortion. This is about saying yes to life. An abortion is actually a cheap solution to the crisis. It costs the government less to provide abortions than it does for them to step in and to help the family that is in financial crisis or to help the um, young adult who was pursuing a university degree or pursuing some kind of higher education. It costs the government less to provide an abortion for her than it does to help keep her in education. It costs the government less to provide an abortion than it does to help create those things that we need to see in terms of childcare and flexible working hours. So abortion is the cheap solution and the easy solution for the government. So it's about more than the government then. It's about the culture that we create. And we do have to ask, how do we do better for women who are facing the crisis? Not just women, but the families as well, who may be involved. Statutory care packages, support provision. Why does the government not do more to help women choose life? I've sort of suggested it's because it's a money thing. Then we have to look at our own communities, the areas that we live in. Are there any advocates for life in our areas? Are there any crisis pregnancy providers in our areas, in your area? Now, Both Lives Matter is not a service provider, but we do signpost to service providers on our website. And these service providers can offer practical help and support, and also, in some cases, counselling. But community, family, friends, that's who's vital whenever a woman is facing a crisis in pregnancy. And we often hear that phrase, it takes a village. And it does, it does take a village. And it takes our time and it requires something personal of us. It requires a sacrifice on our part. Now that could be a sacrifice of our money if we're giving some help financially. A sacrifice of our time, maybe even a sacrifice in terms of our home, if we're thinking about fostering or helping a young woman who might be in crisis. And also church. What does it say or what does it look like for the church, for your church, to say both lives matter? Now we're not here to tell you what to do, it's just posing a question. Maybe there's a counsellor in your church who would be willing to say, yes, if anyone's facing a crisis, I'm the counsellor and I'm prepared to provide counselling for that person free of charge. And then the church community knows that there's somebody there that can help. Maybe it's about being able to gather items or be with a woman who needs help, make sure that um, she's not on her own, she's not feeling lonely, that she has that support system. But it's, like I said earlier on, it's not good enough to say no to abortion. We have to look at the ways that we're saying yes to life. So as we close, I just want to tell you about a young, well, I was going to say a young woman. She's my age, so she's not really that young anymore. Um, but I met her last week. Um, and she wanted to share her story, her own abortion story, with us. And it was such a privilege to meet with her. But what really struck me was that this was from 1993. So this um, woman has been carrying her own abortion story in secret for the most part. Only a couple of people know about it for nearly 30 years. Now, 1993 was the same year that I had my pregnancy crisis. Now, unlike Sarah's mummy, 
I didn't have an abortion, and I now have a daughter who's coming 29. And as I listened to her, I'm going to just read out a little bit of what she said to me. In fear of an earthly family's wrath and shame, I made the worst decision of my life. Now she has sat with that for nearly 30 years. And the people, including people in her family, a couple, one person in particular, who out of love for her and love for the wider family said, you need to have an abortion, this would kill our parents and grandparents. So she did, she had an abortion. She felt that there was no one who would support her in raising her baby. And then she carried that burden for nearly 30 years on her own. The family member who said that to her didn't have to carry that burden. No one else carried it. She carried it. Her story's on our website. It's called Sarah's Story. But right at the end, her final paragraph, she came to faith in Jesus and found healing and was able to release that burden that she was carrying. And she said, I believe in a loving, merciful and gracious God who gave me the three children that I longed for. She went on to have two boys. I like to think my first baby was a girl. I would have named her Sarah. My heartfelt prayer is that in the next life, he, God, will let me hold her, or him, if I've got that wrong, in my arms, and tell them how much I love them, how very sorry I am for not trusting our Heavenly Father enough to walk the path that I chose upheld by him. Now those are her words. And there's a message of hopefulness there in a merciful and loving God and in the fact that she was able to find healing and release from that burden. But the message to us in line with this slide is that we all can be part of the problem that is abortion culture or part of the solution. And for most women, as much as we can criticize the government, they don't actually need the government. Um, they just need their friends. They need their family, regardless of whether this is planned or perfect circumstance. They need their family and friends to say congratulations, and you're not on your own. And this isn't about imposing a pro-life view on that woman. This is about enabling and empowering her to choose life for her and her baby, so that she doesn't come 30 years later to tell someone like me of the burden she's been carrying on her own. And I pray that, as I said at the start, and I've no idea of the time we've taken, I'm so sorry because I didn't look, um, but I pray that what something that we have said has touched your heart to, to show that God's heart is for both lives and pregnancy and prompt you to be part of the solution. Let us pray. Father God, I trust that you will have taken and used the words that we have spoken, that anything we've said that hasn't been, um, hasn't been helpful will be swept away, um, but that, Father, you will have sown seeds of life, seeds of light, seeds of hope and joy, that will help us to counter a pro-choice culture that would seek to terminate the tiniest and most vulnerable image bearers of yours and harm the women that are carrying them. Father, in your name, amen. Don and Marion, thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, we're going to break again for a few minutes before mov moving on to the Q&A. If you'd like to grab any more tea and coffee at the back. Um, and if you'd like to have any questions for Don and Marion, please send them through to the address above or come up and speak to me and I can read them out. So we'll meet, meet back again in a couple of minutes. If 
I could bring your attention back to the front. And we've got a number of questions through, so thank you very much to all who sent them. I'm going to invite Don and Marion back up to the front. Sorry. Um, first question is, would you comment on buffer zones around clinics? Are some protests counterproductive? And what advice have you about public demonstrations? So as an organisation, as a campaign, we don't take part in, pro in protests um, or counter demonstrations, or indeed, for the most part, which is what happens, um, people would stand outside and offer leaflets and offer support for women who are going in to have a termination. We don't do any of the above. What we would say, and we've always defended the public space that is outside any centre that's offering abortion, we've always defended the right of people to be there to offer support, to pray, and that is for the most part what happens there are some groups and some instances where maybe the, the individuals or organisations contribute to the tension in a public space. But what we have to remember is that there are currently laws in existence that protect against harassment and intimidation or abusive, aggressive, offensive behaviours. There's an agenda behind the, the call for buffer zones, which is to remove dissent from the public square, to silence opposition. And it's not just in a physical location. We've seen this week, and actually tomorrow night on Panorama, there's a program, there's a, a targeting of centres that are um, offering alternatives to abortion. Doesn't matter if they're regulated, doesn't matter if they're open and transparent. There is a strategy to shut them down, to say they're offering um, misleading information or harmful information. And um, in light of all of that, I would say that anybody who does want to offer help to women right at that last point before they were going to terminate their child, if they have a right to be there, they also have a responsibility to do that sensitively and well. Um, I think I would just add to that um, about the um Persuading, I think that's the bit under the law influence. around influence. Sorry, that's the word influence under the law at the minute around that has been brought in um, to do with buffer zones. And I suppose that's the bit that I find um, I find personally uh, quite concerning. What exactly does that word mean? What is it? What what is the breadth of influence um, that they are talking about? And I'm not sure how well defined that is. I'm not sure how well that stands up in a court of law either. Um, I don't know if you have been following, but last was it last week, two weeks ago, um, there was a lady who had been um, charged and uh, a priest actually who had as well, but the cases um, were, were dismissed, were, were thrown out of court. So it's an interesting time at the minute to watch this happening. And we obviously would be concerned because although we don't actually do that, um, we do know that at times it has had a positive impact and it, it has been helpful for women who have then chosen to keep their babies or to at least birth their babies um, and, and, and do life with their babies. So that word influence in the law would be the, the concerning part for us. Um, just put the next two together. Have you come across examples of pregnancies as a result of rape or incest going full term? And what about the circumstances when there is a risk of death of both mother and baby? Um. Would it be okay if I invited somebody from your congregation up to share something, if you were happy to do that, what, that you've just shared with me? And it answers, I then said, did you put this question in? <laughs> um, so I think you can answer that. And we might say something as well, but just. Hello, Henry McCauley. Um, just don't ask me to speak about this because uh, years ago, there was a friend of ours who 
went out on a night, uh, I think it was a Christmas party, and um, she had something put into her drink, and she went home that night, eventually, got home, didn't know how she got home, and then obviously a month or two later she realised, no period, what's the problem, found out she was pregnant. So she had obviously been raped on the night of the uh, company, company party or company do. Uh, that girl, with the advice of her minister at the time, she was going to church, she was a Christian, made a profession of faith. She went on to have that child. And the two of them have grown up as uh, lovely girls. A um, lot of pressure on her at the time. A lot of pressure as to what to do, what will the family say, what will people say, what will the neighbours think. Um, but she went ahead, had the child, and the two of them are tremendous today. So, you know, there's a situation with rape, and the question does come up, what's the situation, what do you do? What harm has the child done? The child has done no harm, but the child is the one that's being aborted. But thankfully... Those two are in great form today. And I do want to just add to that. Um, I felt that it was really timely, actually, to have that shared just as we were reading the question that had been posed. But it is important to say that, you know, circumstances aren't always such that a woman will continue um, to give birth to her baby in circumstances of rape. But I think the default assumption in society is that she shouldn't, or indeed can't. And a number of years ago, um, a rape crisis service in Dublin did a survey among its own um, clients. And they found that of the women who had become pregnant through sexual crime, I think 85% chose to continue with the pregnancy and give birth to their baby. And in doing so, they felt that they had reclaimed some of the control that had been taken from them. So it's a very difficult and sensitive issue, and probably time doesn't allow for us to really drill into it. But the general statement that we would make is that we shouldn't assume that it is best for the woman involved, and we need to always remember that there are two lives involved and that for most women, if they're given the support that they need, then they can choose life. The final thing I would say is that the previous law did provide for a legal exception in cases of rape based on a gang rape of a teenage girl um, in the late 30s. And the bar was set very high that uh, because of her mental state after that gang rape, the law said she could have. The determination had happened, but the law then said actually they, were, they would acknowledge that in certain circumstances where mental health was in a, at risk in a way that was real serious, long-term, permanent, then the law would have defended the care for that woman. And in those circumstances, that would have been a termination. Now, all of that to say we don't make the assumption that it's best for her, and we're always mindful that a life is lost. And then final question, what advice do you have for Christian midwives and doctors who are caught up in managing women on the termination of pregnancy pathways? This is a really, really tough one. And um, actually we're talking to a few uh, a few individuals involved in the health system at the minute who are really wrestling with this. Um, what we want to do is support them um, to understand the pressures that they're under. We know that um, from legal advice that uh, we were a part of, they were encouraged to be really upfront about what they would and wouldn't be prepared to do to put that in writing and to sort of lay the groundwork for that in their own profession. But we would um, have concerns and share concerns that effectively a glass ceiling is being brought in, that there are certain levels of management that people won't want to then um, 
progress to because it gets harder and harder for them to distance themselves from termination. There are also branches of medicine that women and men, whether that's in midwifery, in nursing, or in obs and gynae, that people are feeling actually, I either can't stay in that place or I don't want to go into that branch because I do not want to take part. So there's a very real concern that those professions will be left without people of faith or without people who value both lives. And that does impact on the care that a woman who faces a medical um, uh, tension would, would feel that um, if she doesn't have professionals looking after her who value both lives, what alternatives to termination will she be offered? So it is a very real concern and one that we are mindful of, one that we're sort of monitoring and hoping to work with our healthcare, and medics, our healthcare uh, professionals and medics um, who are currently in that sphere. We want to work with them to understand what they're facing and see what we can do to help in the policy end. Oh, um, yes, sorry, I forgot, um, or didn't forget, but I, because I'd lost track of time. Um, on March 26th, we are um, holding a day that we're inviting churches to be a part of. Uh, it's called God Unborn, nine months between the angel and the manger. Um, to just take five minutes in a service, I'm being a bit cheeky because I didn't actually say to Mark before I said this, um, but we're asking churches who can give five to seven minutes of their time to um, take a look at the resource that we have provided and set aside time on that day, and there's more information about that, but to just really reflect on the fact that there's something really special and beautiful and wonderful in the fact that God ch chose to begin his human journey in exactly the same way that we did as an embryo and developed just like us. So in a country or in a society and culture that says vulnerability, fragility, dependence, um, and even sentience is what enables us to be chosen to live and have value, God in all his amazing wonder chose to be the most vulnerable, the most fragile, the most dependent and grow just like us. So if you'd like to know more, um, I'd invite you to send us an email or talk to us after. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight and thank you especially to Dawn and Marion for sharing with us. And then we just close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that all human life is made in your image and is precious in your sight. Lord, help us to be courageous, wise, and compassionate in defending the lives of unborn children, supporting expectant mothers, and supporting those who have had abortions. May we love and serve these women as Jesus has shown us. Lord, we thank you for organizations like Both Lives Matter. Thank you for the vital work they do in your name. We ask that through this organization, you would meet the emotional and practical needs of women and their families. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.